2015, an elite DFS Army Commando unit formed to bring high-level DFS strategy to the masses. Today, hated by DFS sharks and lineup sellers alike, they continue their quest to turn Joe into DFS Pro. Alright, good morning Army and welcome to the Taco Tuesday PGA Daily Fantasy Golf Podcast presented to you by DFSArmy.com. Sign up today using the link in the description to gain access to our premium fantasy golf tools, including the cheat sheet which will be referenced on today's podcast, the Domination Station lineup optimizer, and tools for every single daily fantasy sport there is. So come check us out at DFSArmy.com. Support the pod using promo code TACO on sign up for a lifetime 20% off. Okay, so this week we are staying in Texas for the Dean and DeLuca Invitational, formerly known as the Crown Plaza. And uh, it's not much traveling if you played last week at the Byron Nelson since uh, the Colonial Country Club in Fort Worth, Texas, that we're playing at this week is only a 30 minute drive away from last week's venue at the TPC Four Seasons in Irving. So a very similar tournament to what we had last week. And the course is kind of similar as well. You know, similar greens. And the weather should be uh, sort of similar as to what we saw last week, you know, with uh, the rain and the, the wind picking up. Uh, we'll know a lot more about that as Wednesday comes along. But uh, looking at the course, uh, it has really small bent grass greens with a stint meter around 12, so about average. Uh, it's a 7,200-yard par 70, so a very long par 70. And a lot of that is due to the setup of the course. Uh, this week, instead of going to four or five par 3s like some par 70s do, they just got rid of a lot of par 3s and par 5s. Uh, only two par 5s on the entire course. And you have your usual allotment of four par threes and one of them is very long in fact one of the par fives also extraordinarily long uh, this was one of the bottom three tournaments last year in eagle percentage so par four scoring being able to make birdies on par fours absolutely crucial this week and when it comes to par four scoring uh, no other stat tells the story a little more than Stroke scanned approach. Uh, it's going to be so key this week with the smaller greens, with most par four scoring happening on the approach shots. It's just absolutely key to everything. And you will definitely want to check out those par four scoring numbers. I added it to the main sheet this week uh, an adjusted par four scoring number, and that's just uh, weighted equally between the different types of par fours that we have this week. Uh, so that's pretty cool. We can pretty quickly see who's good at these par fours and who's not. Uh, this tournament has a long time sort of a, uh, affiliation with legendary golfer Ben Hogan. Uh, not only did he destroy this tournament in years past, but he's always involved in the festivities. Like This might as well be called the Ben Hogan instead of the Dean and DeLuca Invitational. Uh, just such a such a huge step back when they took over the sponsorship of it, either last year or the year before that, because the like, Crown Plaza, that looked like a really nice name for a tournament. Dean and DeLuca in all caps, just like the players. Uh, not so much, it looks kind of cheesy, but nonetheless, you always want your tournament sponsored, or more interested in what's going on with the players involved. So let's jump right into this field here. We've got a pretty decent field this week, uh, better than last week. You've got Jordan Spieth, who is the course horse here, he is essentially tied in odds with John Rahm, who's coming off of one of his worst performances of recent memory uh, when he was in contention at the the players tournament a few weeks ago and then just absolutely sunk like a rock on Saturday. Ended up MDFing. Was not great, but Spieth, he, he's just off of two missed cuts in a row here at the players and the Byron Nelson, so 
who knows what to make of these top guys here. Uh, it's looking like Sergio might actually be the best play in this range because Spieth and Rahm are 13 to 1. Sergio is 14 to 1, and he's $1,000 cheaper than Rahm. He's only $200 cheaper than Spieth. Uh, that pretty much looks to be the play here. Sergio has been fine. I just really don't like his par, fo uh, par 4 scoring. It's a lot worse than everyone $8,000 or more outside of Siwoo Kim, but he's kind of a weird case. And without there being a Dustin Johnson or a guy who everybody is going to pile on, uh, it's kind of hard to, to know what all to make of this slate yet before a lot of the other touts come out with stuff. It seems like a week that you'd want to play very contrarian or just against the ownership, but I don't see anyone up top at least that everyone's going to pile on to. Because the two course horses, the two guys with course history that just sticks out like a sore thumb, that would usually be chalky, are guys in just really bad form. Uh, Spieth has missed three of four cuts. Uh, did finish 11th at the Masters, but really concerning for him. We haven't even seen him miss cuts like this before in his entire career. But if you just look at his course history here, no finish worse than 14th and four starts runner-up last year and is the defending champion uh well runner-up in 2015 the defending champion from 2016 where he ran away with it just absolutely killed this course uh, if it weren't for his terrible form he would be the very easy all-in move here but it's really hard to look at his current form and be too confident about that uh, I think that people are going to pile on to John Rahm like they always do because they will see he made the cut last week and he's still perfect on cuts. But that he looked pretty bad on Saturday. Granted, that was just one round at TPC Sawgrass, which is a pretty crazy course. So uh, I'd be I'd definitely be willing to overlook that and get back on Rahm because there isn't really too much to spend on this week. And... Uh, uh, before I forget, the other course horse that absolutely sticks out here up top is Zach Johnson at 9,800. Now, obviously, he's been in absolutely terrible form all year this year. But he's put a few cuts together in a row, and his course history is just fantastic with multiple wins in the last eight years, uh, five straight top 10 finishes in that span, until recently when he's only put up you know, top 20s, but it's still just really, really good. Um, he's not as good of a golfer as he was anymore, you know, during that stretch. Um, it's not that he's fallen off completely. He's just in a quite a slump so far this year, so it's hard to really pile on to him at such a high price. But like I said, the options are a bit slim up here. Uh, there, there's also Paul Casey at 10200 and Matt Kuchar at 10100 and that seems quite pricey for these two guys, but they're they're clearly the fourth and fifth favorite on the board here. Uh, it's you have to get down to the eight nine thousand dollar range, like lower down there, to find some really nice values. And this might actually be a perfect week to go all middle or all mid range kind of guys, because uh, unless you just believe in the Rom train uh, or think Sergio is a fine pick, which he'll probably be a fine pick, but I don't really see him winning again. I see him just kind of putting up a top 20, top 30 and calling it a day, and that par 4 scoring just really scares me. But nonetheless, uh, nothing really wrong with the Kucher, who's who did well last week, but is at a course he had historically been great at. Then again, this is a course that he's also historically been great at outside of a miscut on 2014. He has two straight top 7s and... Pretty much makes the cut every single year. Um, nothing wrong with Kuchar, it's just he's so expensive. Uh, there's no FanDuel this week, so it's hard to say, oh, just play him on FanDuel or whatever. It's just DraftKings this week, so we will have to pay for the Bud Collies of the world and so on. But uh, Kuchar, maybe he won't be too popular with that high of a price, but if you've got the money, why, why not? He's... He's solid. Like, I would play him in cash, as as always. Um, moving down into the $9,000 range, Kevin Kisner at $9,700. Uh, two straight top 10 finishes here. 
But after that ridiculously great start to the season, he hasn't looked that great in his last two events, missing the cut at the Wells Fargo, and just kind of you know sizzling out at on the weekend at the Players. Uh, but still, he's the best par four score in this range outside of John Rahm, and uh, that's pretty much been his specialty. Uh, throughout the last several years on tour, he's been among the top like three in the par four, 400 to 450 range, where we have seven holes on this course from. So that's a really encouraging stat right there. I think he actually ranks number one in the entire field. You know, just barely over John Rahm at that specific range. So pretty interesting play right there. And if you're just looking at odds to pricing, it really does not favor him. Uh, it really want you to go down to Jason Duffner there at the bottom of the 9,000s, but we'll get to him in a second. Um, I don't see a lot of people playing Kisner with the recent form not quite being there, but um, long term his form's been pretty good, and this this course, uh, this course absolutely suits his play style. So I do like him a lot, and I like him a lot more than the guy who will be super popular this week, Bud Colley at 9,500 which seems like a crazy price for him. But he has now posted three straight top tens in a row, and it's really hard to ignore him. I I really wish that there was FanDuel this week so I could just go all in on Kali on FanDuel where he's perpetually underpriced and just call it a day. But this is all the options we've got unless you want to go play on Fantasy Draft or something. And at 9500 maybe it's expensive enough to keep his price down, but I think people are still going to just look at those top 10s and lock them in. Uh, the problem I see with him is outside of Sergio in this like eight to or 8,000 up dollar range, he is the worst at par 4 scoring. Uh, actually right beneath Sergio and Phil Mickelson. So I don't really like that, and a lot of Kali's success comes from par 5s, and the par 5s are pretty freaking nerfed this week. So... I might be off of him, uh, maybe not completely, but most of the way off of him, just because I think he's going to be pretty popular. We'll have to see how that shakes out. Uh, Mark Leishman, a guy who just burned us at the players pretty hard, but then turned it around with a, a T13 finish last week at the Byron Nelson. Uh, great course history here, for six for six in cuts, uh, several top 30s in a row, T13 finish last year. Uh, it looks like a solid cash play pretty much as always, outside of the players, which is always a pretty unpredictable place from year to year. He's looked very good this season, so I like him a lot. Uh, underneath him, Webb Simpson at 9,100. Don't like him as much, but he finished third here last year, so it's hard to ignore that. It's just no one's going to pick him. They're all going to go to Jason Duffner there at 9,000, and he's just kind of everything you want. Uh, he's he's got the distance and the accuracy off the tee. He's obviously got the, the great approach game. And the one weakness that had been plaguing him, uh, putting, he's actually looked pretty good at recently. So very, very intriguing play. But everyone is going to be on him. Dude doesn't miss cuts. Dude always plays well at courses he has good course history at here. And this is definitely one of his courses. Uh, three times in the last five years, he's finished T6 or better. A couple of uh, second-place finishes in that span as well. Five straight made cuts. Long-term, he's made, I think, eight of nine cuts. Uh, the dude's a beast here. I, I guess the recommendation, similar to some of the other plays I've been seeing here, uh, play him in cash and perhaps fade him in GPP, since he doesn't really finish in the top ten. He'll finish like T20 at best. Problem is, I don't really see him missing the cut, like, almost ever. But maybe maybe one of these days. I don't know. You just got to hope for a, a lower finish than expected and hope to hit with some, some of your pivots. Um, problem is, I don't like a lot of the pivots here in this range. Kali, Simpson, uh, Mickelson at 8,800. I mentioned his crappy par 4 scoring this year. And something I really don't like about him is the fact that he's still perfect as far as cuts made on the year which kind of messes up uh it, it kind of messes up things for ownership like if people see that 
10 out of 10 or 9 out of 9 on the, the cuts for the year that pops up. They're, they're just going to play them. People love playing guys like that. and People love Phil Mickelson. If they're left-handed, they're pretty much already locking him in. Uh, he has only played at this course once in the past decade, and that was back in 2010 when he missed the cut. Uh, statistically, he looks pretty bad this year, honestly. Uh, well under average in driving accuracy, greens and regulation, strokes gained off of the tee. And those are things that you really want to be seeing from Phil. Uh, the upside for him is he does birdie a lot, he eagles a lot, but that is kind of really nerfed at this course, which is so focused on par 4 scoring, and that's just not his game. He's better at the par 3s and 5s, so I don't like Phil here. Um, I do like Tony Finau at 8,700. Uh, he's made two straight cuts here, uh, did pretty well in both of those. Uh, made up for the miscut at the players uh, the other week by finishing T13 last week. Looked pretty dang good. Good form overall in the season. Absolutely excellent numbers in the efficiency scoring projections. Great par 4 scoring. Uh, just great strokes gain, T to green game. The dude does everything except for putt. And that's kind of what I'm looking for here. I like Finau a lot as one of my favorite plays on the board. And uh, the only thing I can think of with that is maybe everyone else will too. I'm, I'm not sure if he'll be popular or not. He's kind of hard to guess. But uh, judging by the last few times he's been on slates like this, he does really tend to get very popular no matter what price he's at. So I might have to eat the chalk a little bit there. But he's a play I definitely like. Uh, Harmon at 8500 Seems interesting. Uh, three straight made cuts, all top 30 finishes. Uh, didn't miss the cut after his win at the Wells Fargo, but just didn't do well. Just kind of really blew up on the weekend at the players, but that's forgivable. Um, he's a fine play, 8,500. Just his odds are really bad for everyone else in this range. He's in the 30s and 40s. He's up there in the 50s, uh, which is kind of weird since he just won. But, you know, we're used to seeing him in like the six, seven thousand dollar range. But right underneath him is a play that I like a lot more, and I'm sure a lot of other people like him more. I think he's eleven for eleven in uh made cuts this year. And this has just been his breakout year, and that is Adam Hadwin. Uh two straight top twenty five finishes here in his only two starts. Uh fifth place in twenty fifteen. Uh, the dude is consistent. He's a he's a baller. He, he's great at any course where you need a mixture of accuracy and driving, which is absolutely this course with the more narrow fairways, but the need for distance with a lot of these holes. Uh, I like Hadwin a lot in that regard, and 8400 is a really fair price for him. Uh, I just you know I think he'll be popular, not like Duffner popular, but almost. I I don't think people will overlook him whatsoever. Uh, Chris Kirk at 8,200. Kind of an interesting case where he's had a really, really bad form recently until uh, him finishing T12 at the players. But his course history here is just phenomenal. In the last six years, uh, the only six tournaments he's played here, he's finished 16th or better in five of those, winning, in, or winning the event in 2016 or 2015. And just absolute dominance here uh with his signs of life at the players i might be tempted to play him it's just like he's been so ridiculously bad missing four or five cuts in a row before just barely squeaking by at the wells fargo and just blowing up on the weekend and pretty much finishing dead last if not mdf'd so We've seen one good tournament out of him. It's just at the players where there's a lot of variance and noise. I don't exactly know if he's back in form yet. But if there is any course to get him back in form, it would be his best course, which is right here. Um, On to another sort of course horse here. Uh, Brant Snedeker, 5-for-5 five five in cuts. Uh, finished second place right behind Kirk in 2015. 17th last year. Uh, he missed the cut last week, and he has that concern about uh, an injury with his wrist. If it wasn't for that, I would be all over the Sneds at 8100 It's so cheap for him. But with those injury concerns, I really can't invest too much to him. And it's a shame. 
Great par four scoring, especially from the key ranges this week. I love everything about the play. Just am worried about his wrist. We will have to see if there are any updates on that. But the fact that he's signing up for a tournament the week after missing the cut, uh, it's encouraging. It shows that he's not too worried about it. So he could be a really solid play, and he's just so cheap. And to finish off the $8,000 range, we have Siwoo Kim, who is just such the interesting case. Uh, I honestly thought he was leaving to go serve in the military in Korea, but I guess his time has not come quite yet. Um, he had a good finish at Texas, then won the players out of nowhere by three strokes after what was quite an abysmal injury-filled season where we saw him withdraw four different times, miss the cut uh, seven times. But if there, were, if it wasn't for the fact that he was like holding his back and just not looking that great while winning the players, granted by multiple strokes here, I mean, it's such a crazy thing, but if it weren't for that, I would be kind of all over him here. But it's just there's still so many concerns about him. Obviously, the stats on him look terrible because he's been terrible. But if he's if he's playing, like it's sort of like Snedeker. If he's playing the week after citing all these concerns, well, in his case, it'd be two weeks after. But still, he's coming back to action. Uh, it, it's a good sign, but it's it's just one of those situations where you can't invest too heavily into him because it, a withdrawal would just absolutely kill you even worse than a miscut and that's what we're risking with playing si Wu kim uh going into the upper seven thousand dollar range ryan palmer has very good course history here three top fives since 2012 uh his form obviously was bad until recently he's put together a few good finishes sixth in texas 11th at the rbc heritage and last week uh, t27 so I, I like him. He's still a bit cheap. And, he, you know, he likes to show up at courses where he shows up all the time. And then he has other courses where he misses the cut every single week. Uh, and that's pretty much Palmer for you. He did miss the cut in 2015. But he just makes for a great GPP play. Uh, I wish they wasn't so par 5 scoring dependent. Because par 4 numbers are not great at all. And that's just the one just uh, statistical concern with him, but he's really underpriced for his odds. He's 34 to 1 down here with guys that are 50, 60, 80 to 1. So, pretty obvious value right there. Now, on to last week's surprise winner. Uh, sort of another Si Woo Kim situation. Billy Horschel had three missed cuts in a row where he wasn't only missing cuts. He was coming dead last in these fields. Like, dead last, putting up plus 10 really terrible numbers came back and won in a playoff over jason day this week or this last week and that's quite a feat believe me ask kevin kisner he's lost multiple times to jason day in a playoff it's a tough thing to do but he did on the first hole granted uh, day choked the putt to him but still the dude is great putting out of his mind him and day were the best putters in the entire field and it wasn't really close uh, so he's coming in here with hot form. It's just that typical, what do you do with a guy that just won thing? You know, will he go back to sucking again? That wouldn't surprise. Will he go back to being sort of his former self? Because if you think about Billy Horschel from like 2015, 2016, the dude just finished top 20, top 30 pretty much every tournament he was at. He was not known for missing these cuts. That's why it was so weird seeing him at the bottom of the leaderboards. Like usually he's a steady and consistent dude. Uh, he's obviously put it together for one week last week. He he put it all together, did very well, and it's just hard to know what where to go from here. Um, I I guess just kind of fade because he's not gonna win two weeks in a row. Uh, famous last words right there, but I really don't see that. Maybe people will be on him just because he won last week. Uh, a pivot. I don't know if you really need to pivot. Cause I don't think he's gonna be that popular, but. Another play in this range that I really do like, they'll probably go overlooked. Uh, Emiliano Grillo uh, at 7,800. I guess he has a nice looking game log, so he won't go too overlooked, but he's a player I really do like a lot. This course suits his game perfectly. He's a great par 4 scorer. He's great at approach, great off the tee overall. 
uh, accuracy and driving both there. Uh, I like him a lot, and he's pretty underpriced. Kind of been flying under the radar a little recently, but he has that T11 finish at the players is pretty sneaky, and the top 10 at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Pretty strong fields right there. Hasn't been missing cuts. I like Grio a lot. Uh, moving down along here, we have a few familiar names that we're starting to see week to week as like the values. The Ali Schneider Jans, the Cameron Smiths of the world. Uh, Pat Perez, probably the play I like the best in this mid $7,000 range. He is really, really mispriced as far as just like odds go. He's 40 to 1 down here with guys 70, 80, 90 to 1. Pretty interesting there. Fifth here last time out, but not really the greatest course history before that. And this year he's made pretty much every cut. And outside of crapping the bed on the weekend at the RBC Heritage, where of course I pretty much went all in on him, um, he's been posting like top 20 finishes constantly. He's done that his last two times out. Second at Wells Fargo. Obviously it did really sneaky well at the Masters. Uh, I like the play a lot. Great, great GPP play. I just wouldn't. I guess great in cash too. Just great all over the place. Once again, I wish FanDuel was in action this week because he would once again be underpriced. I could just play him there. But nonetheless, playing Pat Perez this week, uh, maybe not so much Kokrak. He was. I think he was just an anomaly, and his par four scoring is like really, really terrible. I don't buy it. Uh, he's going to go back to missing cuts or finishing T60 or whatever. Trust me on that one. Uh, Lucas Glover, really bad course history here, but really great form overall. Uh, I don't really care about course history quite as much as I usually do week to week. So I'll play some O'Hare, or I'll play some Glover. I don't know about O'Hare. Uh, same price, 7500 Uh Finished fifth at the Byron Nelson. Really, really sneaky. Uh, but his form... And his course history here, not so great. Uh, you would pretty much just be playing him because of last week's performance. Uh, Kyle Stanley, another super popular guy in this range. Same price as Sun Kang, who could not get a price a price bump despite another top 20 finish here. So these two guys, Stanley and Kang, they're going to be crazy popular. Uh, it's hard to say who will be more popular, but I just know they both will be, and for good reason. Neither have good course history, but Kylie, or Kyle Stanley has really bad course history here. Uh, his last five finishes were a miscut, a T68, miscut, miscut, T52. Uh, not great, but sort of like Bud Colley. He's been putting up those top 10 finishes lately. Uh, also kind of similar to Kevin Chway in that regard. So just be a pure form play. And with this event being so similar to last week, although Stanley didn't play last week. This goes for Kang a little bit. Guys that did well last week, I'm kind of inclined to play them again this week. Uh, especially your guys like your Hoffmans or your Kyle Reifers, whatever, that always play well in Texas. You know, these courses have a lot of crossover. And Stanley has done pretty well in Texas. Kang obviously has done fantastic in Texas so far this year. So I like those guys. Why not? I just like Kang a little more because he's... He's just been going bananas <laughs> recently, and I think for whatever reason, people will be on Stanley more. So he just saw him get that T4 at the players, um, but some sneaky plays in this range. I don't know if McDowell will be sneaky because of all the made cuts he has in a row, but same price as Kang and Stanley, um, so he'll just be underpriced due to people going to them, and... Uh, and I, I couldn't really play David Lingmurth, but he has really good course history here. Uh, three made cuts, T5 in 2014. Uh, recently, recently we've seen him pull an MDF at the players and finish top 20 at Wells Fargo. But before then, his form was just garbage, so I couldn't really play him here. Uh, and on to uh, this week's... Probably this week's top play. There are two guys that should be in the $8,000 range or so that just got knocked down to oblivion. Uh, one uh, one guy, Charlie Hoffman at 7300 It's just nuts. Uh, long term, he's 8 for 8 in cuts here. Finished 10th in 2015. Has been making cuts on the season. 
Like, what, what are you doing, DraftKings? What is this ridiculous pricing? He's so off compared to everyone else in this range. He's going to be super popular. You're going to want to play him because he's just so, so underpriced. He should be fine here. He makes the cut. It's hard to justify fading him based off of ownership just because he makes the cut so freaking often. It's not going to hurt you if you take a bunch of him. So I like him. And my saving grace in this price range would be Nick Taylor, a guy that everyone will look at and go, damn, this guy's been on fire, because he has been on fire. Two straight top ten finishes in a row for him now. Just keeps killing it, just getting better and better every week. Made the cut two years in a row here. Uh, Nick Taylor at 7,300. Going to be an awesome play. Just play him with Hoffman. He's looking really nice. I would just obviously prefer a lot more Hoffman than Taylor, and I'm hoping that Taylor steals some of the ownership off of Hoffman here. And if you want to be really sneaky at this price range, because no one will play these guys, they'll all go to Taylor and Hoffman, and like Kang and Stanley. Uh, Kyle Reifers just plays great at every Texas course. Uh, finished fifth here last year. He's at 7,300. And Steve Stricker, guy who also never misses the cut here, uh, doesn't have the highest upside, obviously, but he won here back in 2009. Uh, has been making cuts recently. You know, very, very sneaky play, in my opinion. Just very sneaky. And then someone that's so sneaky that I'm not going to play him. The guy's missed four cuts in a row and just looks bad. So bad. He finished, like, dead, dead last at the players. Just awful. Awful. But his course history, I don't know. Harris English, 7,300. Second last year, fifth in 2012. I don't know. I don't know. I, <laughs> I don't know if I can go that far. Uh, Ryan Moore, they're baiting us with him once again. Uh, if you bit the bait last week like I did, he burned you pretty hard at the Byron Nelson, missing the cut. But it's just like long term, the guy's been awesome. He should not be 7,200. They should go back to what they've always done with Ryan Moore and just overprice the crap out of him so you don't even have to think about playing him. But he's an option right there. Ben Martin has good track history here. Three finishes in the top 30 in his three events. Uh, pretty good finishes last time out. Also a few top 30 finishes in a row. Never a really popular guy. I just don't like how he's also another guy that gets a lot of his scoring on par fives. But he's shown success at this course before. So don't really mind him. Uh, a play that I like a lot this week will be William McGirt. Because everyone is going to play Kevin Chue at 7100 uh, for the same price. And they're going to play him a lot more than McGirt. And McGirt absolutely has a case here. And that is, he is near the top of this entire field in par 4 scoring. Like, that is his bread and butter. It always has been. Par 4s, 450 to 500 yards. That's where he makes his money. He's made three cuts in a row here. Pretty much the exact same odds as Tway. Just everyone's going to go to Tway. Four straight top 20 finishes if you count the uh, Zurich Classic. And three top fives in that span as well. Uh, was not looking great. Just barely made the cut last week and then was awesome on the weekend. Uh, one thing I learned about him. Guy that has great course, or course history here at this course. Bob Tway, Kevin's dad. Uh, not from Texas, but from Oklahoma. So local to the area. Um, Texas Swing is where I like using a lot of guys that really do stick out in Texas. And Kevin Tway is a Texas kid. He's going to be popular, but I can't. Yeah, I, I don't want to fade him either. I will probably just play him with the field. It's an awesome story. This kid, this rookie, just coming out of nowhere, just putting all these top fives up. Nice upside there. And he's actually played at this tournament before as an amateur, as like a 17-year-old, 20-year-old, uh, back in 2014. He missed the cut, but not by much, just barely. Uh, so it's kind of encouraging. Uh, 7,000 even. You've got Wesley Bryan, who's very underpriced. Uh, he's missed a few cuts in a row after his win at the RBC Heritage, but this is a course... I like I like him at pretty much any par 70 course where he can abuse the par 4s and not get owned by the par 5s. Uh, Danny Lee has very good course history here at 6,500. And he was showing good form until missing a few cuts in a row in Texas, which he's usually very good at. But 
finished fifth last week at the Byron Nelson, and I'm hoping he can parlay that into a course that he's been very good at because nobody owns him. Like in the weekend slate, he was like 0.5% owned. Uh, and he's the exact same price as the other stud on this slate, who, who's just absolutely a total bait play at this point. The Billy Horschel of this week, and everyone's going to think that too and play him. Bill Haas at 6,900. He's missed three cuts in a row. Started the season off great. Uh, five for five in cuts here. Top 10 back in 2011. This is a total bait. I, I don't know if I can bite, man. I this, I can't really do it. It's he's so ridiculously underpriced, but his form has just been so bad. And three missed cuts in a row is where I kind of take a big step back. Like, whoa, hold up. So I don't really like the play at all. I think the plays in this range are Danny Lee, love that play a lot, and Blaine Barber's not bad either. He's made several cuts in a row and made the cut in his first attempt here last year. Very sneaky play there. And if you don't care at all about form and you're playing Bill Haas, you might as well play Chris Stroud alongside him. Uh, he's finished top 15 four of the last five years here, but he's missed like a bunch of cuts on tour. And the only cut I think he's made this year it was at the Puerto Rico Open, that super scrub event. So I can't get too excited about that. Uh, headed towards the bottom of this list, I like... I like Matt Jones a lot at 6,800. Uh, Stuart Sink is back, and he's missed two of his last three cuts now, but before that, his form was like perfect. He was posting top 30s every single week. And that's pretty much the case for his form here. Uh, put up a bunch of top 30s, and then has missed the cut his last two times out. And there are some gaps in there, so he hasn't really made the cut here since 2011. Um... Don't know if I can go too hard on him. He's sort of the same play as Luke List at the same price here at 6700 who was looking really great, and we would always play him because he was always underpriced, but he's, his form's just kind of gone down the toilet recently, even more so than Sink, so I'm not too interested in List, and he's kind of a, a bomber in here. Uh, at this course, the pure bombers, they don't have the par fives to attack on. I just... I don't really like them a lot, but it does help with the par 4, so it's kind of a give and take there. Just with the DraftKings scoring, they're not going to have that you know high eagle percentage. But uh, uh, a play, another play I like, um, Zach Blair, 70, or 6,700. Uh, him and Sink actually kind of really do stick out in this range as far as par 4 scoring is considered, so a little more reason to like Sink. Not totally off him like list, but um, they really did, outside of a few of the, the crazy plays, like the Hoffmans and the Laird, uh, well, I'm about to get into Laird here, but the Laird and the uh, uh, the Moors and the Bill Hosses, Charlie Hoffmans of the world, outside of a few of those plays, they really did price these guys on the slate really well. Um, so it's hard to make studs and scrubs lineups this week because, A, there's no real studs to pay up for, and B... Uh, it's really hard down here at the bottom. It's slim pickings. Um, there are a few pickings, just they're they're very slim. Uh, I don't like pretty much anyone 6,400 and under. Um, and they changed the minimum price to $6,300 this week, which is kind of weird. They've been bouncing back and forth between 6,000 and 6,500, but I guess 6,300 is where we're at now. It's just I have a hard time picking any $6,300 guy. Like, I wouldn't play any of them. Um, and the only guy outside of... Well, I'll talk about Martin Laird here real fast. Martin Laird is a nice-looking play at 6600 He's going to be popular. Uh, the odds to pricing makes him stick out a ton. Good course history here. A couple of 10th place finishes back in 2011, 2010. Uh, and outside of his miscut at the players, he's looked pretty good as far as recent form is concerned. So very nice place there to round out your roster. Probably the lowest you need to go. Um, I like Hurley at the same price. Uh, also, he's made five cuts in a row and five straight weeks of playing. The dude's a boss. He just plays every single week. I think he's actually played the most tournaments so far this year outside of Mackenzie Hughes. Um, so that's interesting there. And uh, I really don't have much for you guys in this bottom range, but I will go ahead and talk about one play I'm very interested in. And 
Um, a strategy I like to put out oftentimes is, you know, finding one of these like scrubs that'll have like point three point five percent ownership or whatever and finding the guy that wins and just puts up all of those points or just has like a top three finish or something ends up being like a must play sort of guy not must play but a huge differentiator different oh my gosh let me say this right a huge differentiator i'll go with that he makes the difference in your lineup i've done that strategy a lot and it's really what's led me to success in some big GPP scores, being able to find that that diamond in the rough, and that guy for me, twice, uh, once at the Valero Texas Open where he helped me win multiple GPPs with his 0.4 percent ownership and T4 finish, but also last year, here at the Dean DeLuca, another Texas event, Martin Piller, uh, husband of Jarena Piller from the W, uh, not the W, <laughs> but the uh, LPGA uh, tour, where she's a lot more of a star than he is, but Martin Piller, sixth here last year, and I kind of owed him from him making me all that money at the Valero, played him again here, and he really doesn't play on tour that often, he really just stops by for the Texas Swings, and uh, freaking killed it with his finish last year, he was actually leading after the cut, and was T2 going into Sunday, before he fell off a little bit. But the dude can, uh, I was going to say the dude can ball, but the, the dude can golf. Uh, he's Nobody is going to own him. Uh, I think he's one of the most awesome contrarian plays on the board. Only thing to really worry about is he really hasn't played since last year around this time. But he's a true Texas boy. Gotta like him. Uh, only other plays in this range I see are very questionable. Cameron Tringali, who's made... Several cuts in a row here, but nothing better than 40th, who looked great last week, was uh, in the lead for a while for just settling with a top 10 finish. He could be interesting. And Boo Weekly, who won here in 2013, uh, but I don't see much upside with him. And last play I'll mention, uh, Bryce Mulder finished 10th here last year, but he was the first round leader. Uh, also has a fifth place finish in 2010 and has made five cuts in a row. Not looking that great on tour, but I think this is a course where his skills can come out. Only concern is that his par four scoring is really bad, so I might have well, I might as well have not even mentioned him as a play because so bad. If we're just looking at par four scoring, the play down here at 6400 probably be Ches Reeve isn't bad. He's finished fifth and eleventh here in the last five years. Uh, kind of an interesting play there, but his form has just been bad recently. But yeah, you don't really no need to go down this range too far. Uh, stick to the seven, eight, nine thousand dollar range, and you're going to make some really nice lineups this week. Just try to pivot off of the highest owned guys, since the weather should stir things up a bit, like we saw last week. And if the six out of six percentage ends up being very low, and you have a really nice six out of six, uh, that could cash you pretty big this week. Um, I'm sure the tournaments aren't quite as big, but uh, they're going to fill fast, so make sure that you fill out your lineups a bit earlier this week with there being no fan duel. Uh, I don't know if DraftKings was ready with that or not, but I didn't see like too big of tournaments. But it should be a good one. Uh, I like the I like the Crown Plaza at least. I don't like the name of the Dean DeLuca, but it really is a nice tournament. Very nice, uh, very nice country club that they have there and at the Colonial should be a nice one to tune in and watch on a, a weekend. Just nice, relaxful stuff. Gotta love watching some golf. Just peaceful and awesome. So uh, that will wrap things up here for the Taco Tuesday PGA DFS podcast. And remember, if you want to check out our premium tools, which you should, we've also got European Tour stuff coming out tomorrow. We've got all of our tools, including the, the Stat Cruncher, efficiency scoring projection sheet and the cheat sheet that shows course history among with uh, aggregated odds that we update on Wednesday to show where the odds are drifting uh, recent form field adjusted statistics uh, efficiency, efficiency scoring statistics all that uh, come check us out dfsarmy.com use promo code taco at sign up and that will support us greatly 
we will see you guys next week and have a fun time making those lineups see ya thank you for listening to the dfs army podcast join the dfs army today and gain access to our private slack chat where you can chat with real dfs pros and coaches as well as other dfs army members with winning track records also included in your membership is access to our premium articles dfs army weighted projections for every sport we offer from nfl to mma weekly player picks and cheat sheets the strategy vault of timeless concepts and the dfs army domination station a truly state-of-the-art lineup optimizer offering your personal projections or ours the dfs army membership is the best value across the industry join today and get two free ebooks as well as the secrets to unlocking a new level to your game we